Hi, everybody. I want to welcome you to the uh, IBA board meeting of uh, May, what's today, the 14th. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll start off with, um, do we want to do a pledge, even though there's no flags around? I'm going to put a flag up on the screen. Okay. <laughs> and there we go. And okay. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag Why? of the United, United States, States of America. <laughs> And to the, to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. <clears throat> okay, thank you, everybody. Um, so next is the uh, roll call. <clears throat> so Mr. Diana. Here. Mr. DeSalvo. Present. Here, so <laughs> Present. <laughs> uh, Mr. Brescia. Here. Mr. Gatos? Here. Uh, Mr. Scrabbleis is absent. I hope he's doing okay. Uh, Mr. McCary? Here. Okay. Lori, Vinny, Melanie, Kevin Dowd, Russ Gonzell, Joel Kleiman, staff and attorneys all here. Okay. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so uh, first up is the uh, approval of the minutes and we'll start with the April 9th, 2020 board meeting. Um, and if there's any questions or comments. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't hear what you said, Mike. No, uh, someone made a motion for the minutes. Oh, I didn't hear that. Okay, thank you. I made the motion, yes. Okay. Um, then I, and, uh, I need a second. Second. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's no other further comments or questions. All those uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Okay, good, they're approved. Uh, next up is the April 9th Governance Committee meeting minutes. So if there's any questions or comments. Um, okay, hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to accept those as presented. So I'll move. Thank you. Need a second? I second. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, good. Uh, then we have the April 9th audit committee meeting <clears throat> minutes, excuse me. Uh, again, are there any questions or comments with respect to the audit committee meetings minutes? All right, hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to uh, approve as presented. So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, and then last up is the uh, March 27th audit committee meeting minutes. <clears throat> And those were expanded uh, for direction of last month's meeting. Right. Okay. Yes. Right. I forgot. Um, and it was well done, by the way. Any questions or comments? Okay. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve those minutes. Motion. Thank you. Second. Need a second. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Great. Um, so next up is financial reports and requests for payments. So if you refer to the packet, we have the uh, first schedule, which is the schedule of bank accounts, certificate of deposits, and money markets for the IDA as of April 30th, 2020. And we had a total of $6,700,049 as of April 30th. Um, turn to the next page. It's the income and expense summary for the IDA. We have income year to date of 159,134, total expenses of 997,981. The next page is the income and expense summary for the business accelerator. We have year to date income of 60,449 and total expenses of 876,932. Uh, uh, the next, is the schedule of funds received and vouchers paid. And before we get to that, I just wanna make everyone aware that the two shovel ready projects for the Warwick Valley LDC, we had um, initially $1.5 million and $500,000 specifically for the lab building. Both of those, the 1.5 million funds have been exhausted. And with today's approval, the balance of the 500,000 will have been exhausted also. So um, once we have approval of today's vouchers, uh, there will be um, no more expenditures for the 
Warwick Valley LDC, shovel ready project. Um, if you uh, review the voucher sheet, we have no funds received, but we have total expenses of $64,724.49. And of course, if you look at the bottom, two invoices for the last two for the shovel ready, ready product, uh, project, which have been already dispersed. If there's any questions, Nope. Anybody else have any questions or comments? No. All right. Um, so I guess I'll entertain a motion to approve so the vouchers and payments. Need a second? Second. Okay. okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, and do we need do we need a separate motion for the financial report or no? Sorry? No. No. We need a separate no. motion to approve the financial report? No, no, I didn't think so. Okay. I lost my head there for a minute. Um, okay. There is one um, other thing before we move on, so here, Alan, if you don't mind. Um, sure. The, it's not on the agenda, but it's in the packet. Um, just since it's under financial reports, it'll be simple. There's a resolution authorizing a budget transfer in the amount of $14,000. Um, we have PTAC designated for fourteen thousand dollars or for twenty eight thousand dollars. PTAC is undergoing a bit of a transformation. They've moved from one place to another, so we haven't been able to avail ourselves of the PTAC services for the first half of the year. So we are suggesting that we take that fourteen thousand dollars and move it to the projects and programs research line because of some of the extra expenses we've incurred during the COVID recovery efforts to shift those monies so that that budget line item isn't crazy out of whack um, at the end of the year. Okay. And then, so PTEC's going to have enough then, or are they are they? Aware yeah. Of well, it? we would only have them for if they do, if they can actually reform um, by June. We would only be able to use them for half the year. So oh. twenty eight for the full year, fourteen for half a year. I think that was <clears throat> sufficient. And then we'll okay. revisit it for twenty twenty one. Okay. All right. Thank you. Right. Um, okay. So um, you have a resolution. You want to do that now? I take it. Yes, please. Resolution okay. authorizing a budget transfer in the amount of fourteen thousand dollars. In relation to one of the designated agents of the IDA. Um, well, you need a motion and a second first, right, Kev? Yes. All right, so we'll entertain a motion. A motion. Thank you. Second. Second. Okay, thank you. All right, and then you have to do a roll call. Mr. Schreibeis is absent. Mr. Diana? Yes. Mr. Brescia? Yes. Mr. DeSalvo? Yes. Mr. Gatos? Here. Mr. McCary? Yes. And Chairwoman Rogalski? Yes. That's six eyes, Madam Chairwoman. Resolution is adopted. Okay, very good. Okay, then next up is uh, new and unfinished business, and that would be the Chairman's report. And uh, the only thing I would, well, I suppose I shouldn't say it in this meeting, but I, I would just want to publicly commend the IDA staff for the Herculean efforts they've made since this COVID-19 debacle has happened. I mean, they've really done a terrific job, particularly with the loan, <clears throat> the loan program, which was a really heavy lift. So uh, um, as chair of this fine organization, I wanna personally thank you and make sure that your efforts don't go unnoticed. <clears throat> so that's all I have. So we'll go on to the uh, CEO report. Okay, well, thank you for that. I think on behalf of all of us, I, we, we do appreciate that um, support. And we will extend our thank yous back, by the way, because board members have been called all day, every day throughout this crisis. So your volunteer status has been certainly put to the test. Um, I only have a few things. Vinny and I have a kind of a joint accelerator slash IDA report. But um, first, the I'll go with the one thing that's on the agenda first is the governance committee reviewed um, the IDA policy. So we'll talk about that under the governance committee report. Um, in addition to that, Paris reporting, uh, as you remember from last month and a few months past, we were in an effort to correct some inaccurate data carried over from years before. So Joel worked very closely with the ABO and they worked very closely with us to confirm everything to make sure that the data was correct. This board adopted a um, schedule last month's meeting. So with that all being submitted to the ABO, 2017 and 18 are now closed and Joel is currently working on closing out the 2019 report. Um, That'll be great news because the, you know, it's always, we were prepared to report. We just had to have these last pieces of information included 
So that will be behind us in the coming days. Um, also on an ABO front, we got noticed yesterday that the ABO is reviewing both the Dana Extension Project and the IBM, IBM 2018 pilot project. They're being reviewed by the ABO. They sent us um, kind of a summary or a review of those reports. We're going to review those internally and then respond if there are any, you know, discrepancies in what they've said. It's, it's a lot about transparency, quite frankly, and there's a lot of information that's accessible on our website and they're making sure that we're doing our due diligence to have all of those items available. Um, they, as Joel mentioned, the Warwick Valley LDC funds are exhausted, so Lowkey Brill is no longer monitoring that site, so that, that relationship has come to an end. Um, in your packets, we had, well, not our relationship with Loki Brill, just that one. Um, in your packets, there was a piece of guidance for the ABO. It's uh, some IBO regulation and guidance that was issued in February. And I think we discussed it back then, but just because of COVID, there's been, I think, a lot of, uh, it probably went unnoticed. So just, it's included and for your review, it really discusses the enforcement authority of the ABO and it's about suspending members and executive staff for failure to submit reports, to failure to act with the duty to the authority, to avoid conflicts of interest, et cetera. So I just encourage everyone to read that. In addition, as part of the budget this year, um, there, there was a provision, prevailing wage provision included. So <clears throat> the prevailing wage provision um, is included for projects whose benefits account for at least 30% of their construction costs and that the project is over $5 million. It includes not just IDA benefits, but ED ESD benefits as well, or any kind of public funds, essentially. Um, it's up to the project to determine and certify that they're either within or outside of that 30% threshold. Um, there will be a board that's created to determine the depth and breadth, basically, in the monitoring of this requirement. They will have the ability to delay the implementation, too, if, if it would have a negative impact on the economy, which I'm sure that's a conversation being had in light of the, the COVID crisis and what we expect to be, it's already proving to be, an incredible economic decline. So there will probably be a discussion about that. Um, at this time, though, if all things move forward as, as presented, the prevailing wage will begin to apply to projects whose in incentives are approved after 12-31-21. So it goes into effect January 1st of 2022. Um, so again, we'll monitor that. We have, I've already submitted a number of questions. I've worked really closely with all of our attorneys, including the Brown and Weinrop, who created the um, memo that was in your packet. Um, there are some questions and things that are still being worked through, but we'll keep you posted as we learn more. Um, two last things, Drury Lane, or not Drury Lane, at last month's meeting, you talked about writing down some of the items that we've carried over <coughs> for a number of years. Um, both, it was Drury Lane, Brionics, and New Hampton Technologies. Joel and Kevin have started researching it. Unfortunately, all of those items predate Kevin and me, and so, and they're all in cold storage. Because of the stay at home order, we're not gonna be able to really look into it until we are able to get into the office and get our hands on those. So we had promised we would come back to the board this month on that with the, you know, uh, with the restrictions that are in place, we really can't report, but we will confirm those figures um, as soon as we are able to. I'm sure everyone saw a report in the paper, uh, I think yesterday or the day before about Legoland and how the, the crisis is impacting their business. I have an, a call set up with Legoland on Monday to touch base to talk about um, what this means for us, but um, there hasn't been a lot of panic that I've sensed so far, but I'll certainly report to everyone after that. Um, and one of, the last, one of the last items is just Although New York may be off pause tomorrow and it's potential that even in the Hudson Valley there will be some parts of the economy that are being reopened, we are uh, going to continue at, I, at the IDA to work remotely as long as possible. I was on a call with the Lieutenant Governor a few days ago when, and she in, insisted that if you have the ability to work remotely and hold your meetings remotely that it's in everyone's best interest to continue to do so as long as you can. Um, with that being said, you know, there's an order that allows us to have our meetings via teleconference that, st that still stands and there's actually, as I was chit-chatting before the board meeting, I think a lot, of, um, a lot of appreciation for the amount of accessibility to board meetings that might not have even existed before. So for the foreseeable future, we'll probably have uh, Zoom board meetings. Um, last thing under my report that does require action is that in Oh no, we could do that in governance too. So I will save that and we can do all of that together. And then, um, so that's all that I have. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I have a question with respect to the 
prevailing wage requirements. So this is something new. Yes. Um, it's in the state budget now, or they have to vote on it? It's now. It's in. It's signed by the okay. governor. Right. All right. So that means that I just want to make sure I understand what it means. So in any project that's cost in excess of $5 million that receives any kind of government, whatever, is going to be required to have prevailing wage? That's correct. For the entire project? That's correct. Okay. okay. Yes. And what about the 30% clause, though? That that's if it's 30% benefits for the, the entire project or what? Correct. So, so there are some questions and these are some of the questions that I've had for um, Brown and Weinrob, you know, because I, I, one of my questions was, how do you get to the 5 million? Is it just construction? Is it soft costs? Is it real estate acquisition? What parts of it are actually included? Um, they, Brown and Weinrob said that the definition right now relies on construction work that is going to be defined by that board that I talked about. The other thing is that that it is 30% of public funds, so it could be IDA, ESD, I would assume also some federal funds, if there are federal funds in a project. But again, it's up to the project to certify that they're either inside of or outside of that threshold, which you know I think does put a lot of trust and responsibility on a project operator to self-select into prevailing wage. But um, it's certainly something that's ongoing. So the, the five million mark, is that's just for now kind of nebulous a little bit because it's just construction work. Um, there are also some questions about the, you know, who who's responsible. ESD doesn't necessarily always, we don't always know what the, e, the value of an ESD benefit is and ESD may not have the benefit of ours. So that's gonna require a lot more. It's my, my expectation that it will require a lot more communication in the incentives community to make sure that everybody's aware of what everybody else is doing but well if if, if the <clears throat> excuse me if the project itself or the developer um is required to certify whether they fall in it or not i mean what what's the liability or responsibility of the ida they don't know that yet that's another question that i asked so yeah. i asked about abo i've asked about repercussions to to the authority who's granting the incentives and they just haven't gotten that far so that's again a lot of this responsibility is being put on this public subsidy board that's mentioned in that memo um but i'm gonna like i said i keep following up and we keep asking as the okay. questions come i'm keeping a little list of questions <laughs> but okay. i'll make sure that that's one of the ones because that's that's that was my primary concern is that we all we obviously have to do some adjustment in our application and website to, to right. announce that we are a public fund. Five million dollars isn't a lot of money either. Not a lot. Every almost every one of our projects is over five million. Right. So. That, that that's overkill, I think. But yeah. So I, I think it'll be um, it'll definitely be a learning curve, and it's again not unlike everything that's happening with the SBA. It's going to be I think un, we're going to learn more as it unfolds, and I think that there will be a lot of course corrections. But you know, yeah. Is our you know, that, let me just say that's always been a concern, members past and present, that some of these companies would would not come here because of that if, if we mandated PLAs and the state's mandating a PLA uh, in certain regards. And, right. you know, it's just, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's. It's counterproductive. It'll be a challenge. And I will say that one of the things that I, that the, the a little bit of scuttlebutt and I don't, Again, this is just based on on the little amount of conversation because obviously this has been eclipsed by COVID. But the um, the one thing that I think that might come out of this at least preliminary conversation is that you know because we are in a very different place in as an economy than we were six months ago and even three months ago, that there might be a little bit more of a discussion around the impacts, the thresholds now that might not have existed beforehand. Because we're obviously going to be at a disadvantage projects as the state of New York is, you know, expensive mm -hmm. to operate in. So I think that there will be more conversation about this. I mean, I'm not on that board, so I don't know, but we'll certainly make sure that through every channel that we have for advocacy or at least information be following, you know, every twist and turn. Yeah, because the dollar is way too low. I mean, it, what it's about the, everything. Yeah, what about 485B <laughs> benefits? Are they going to be able to be exempt from that requirement? That's a really good question, actually. I'm gonna I'm gonna write that down on my list as well. And then, um, yeah, they, so there is one little part of this provision that says, um, like one of the exemptions is that tax benefits that cannot be calculated at the time work is to be performed is an exemption to the the threshold. Often, 
IDA benefits, I mean, you can absolutely calculate what the sales tax exemption will be, right? Because it's pretty cut and dry. It's very black and white. But a pilot, you don't necessarily know for sure what the value is going to be over the 10 years because you can't thoroughly estimate what the tax rate is going to be or what the multiplier is going to be you know, 10 years from now, five years from now. So you can assume and you can estimate it, but you don't necessarily know. So that's that's a potential um, option for, you know, not, uh, what would I say? Because that, if that makes, if that's an exemption, then maybe there would be a little bit of flexibility in which kinds of projects fall within those parameters. Mm -hmm. if, that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, so, I mean, it's always been, a, you know, it's always been a fear and even the labor unions locally, and Mike, you can probably attest to this, haven't pushed for that aspect so much because they realize that some of these companies will be walking away. And it's it just, it, it's it's a little scary because you, you want yeah. that business. I mean, the, the, the labor unions, many of them have, have um, worked out their own PLAs outside of the pilots, uh, such as CPV, Legoland, the casino, and quite a few, and Dan Scammer, if that happens, quite a few others. And now if you get, say, maybe before you might have had three, ten, three out of five companies come in here. Now, if you have one or two com companies come in here, that's going to be a lot of lost construction jobs. And it just concerns me. But, um, you know, the state's, you know, making this decision. But I think they don't look at the long term yeah. what's going to happen. But that's just my two cents. So. Well, I agree. And I, I will I'll tell you that I think that we'll just come. I hate to sound like a broken record. I know it's ongoing. I know there are a lot of people who are advocating for and advocating against. And you know, I'm happy to carry back the message from this board and you know the challenges that we see and, and make sure that that's that's been heard. Okay, thanks, Lori. Thank I don't think it takes effect till what 2022 anyway, right? Me too. Right. Yeah, so a lot can happen between now and then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so next up is the accelerator report, correct? Correct. Okay, I'm ready whenever you are. I know, he's got to unmute himself. Okay, here, here we go. All right, so the presentation we're going to show you is a skinny down version of about, I don't know, two hours that we spent with each of the accelerator committee meeting members. So I offer to, you, to any of the rest of you who want to go in depth, we're happy to take it offline with you. But for now, we're going to give you a report of pretty much what has been happening to the accelerator during this crisis. Lori? I'm there. Okay. All righty, next chart. <clears throat> okay, so we'll talk a little bit about the accelerator itself. That's the premises that you guys own and rent and we bring startup companies into. And then the status of Accelerator Without Walls, which was is our consulting support to companies in Orange County that are predominantly in the manufacturing business. Then I'll turn it over to Lori and she'll do a, a nice scorecard by the numbers of what it is the IDA and the Accelerator have done to assist businesses through the COVID-19 crisis and what we're continuing to do. And uh, we're gonna leave you with a proposal to expand our Accelerator Without Walls services beyond manufacturing and basically to cover the companies that we're uh, providing with an OCFC loan as well as the companies that have come to us for help for, uh, to access the CARES program that is the PPP and um, EPP I forget E whatever the other one is. EID, right? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, EDIL. Thank you. And some key takeaways. Okay, next chart. So just, you know, I, I'm sure all of you know this, most of you have had your own businesses or run a business now, uh, even in good times, this is the life cycle of a business. It's well documented. It's an economic theory that holds true has been proved time and time again. I know, as you know, I worked for IBM. You could take the, the mainframe computer and you could plot this on there. So companies start, they have a great idea, they get out there, the company starts to grow. Eventually it matures, the market matures. And then on its own, usually the company has to reinvent itself or it will die. When you get something like a pandemic or a depression or a world war or anything like that, it tends to depress this curve and forces companies, especially those that are weaker into decline sooner. And so many of our companies in Orange County have hit that spot and now it's an inflection point. 
And if they don't find ways to reinvent themselves, those companies will die. And the uh, what we're trying to do as an IDA and accelerator is the dotted lines. Have few of them reach the death curve and more of them into the rebirth cycle. So the rest of this presentation will tell you stories about what we've been doing and how we're working on that. Next chart. Okay. So the good news is the uh, all of our accelerators, of the three accelerators we have, fashion manufacturing, personal care products, and medical devices, and CBD, uh, and cannabis, those three accelerators retained virtually all the jobs we had there. And those companies are growing by about 10 jobs. So they're hiring right now. That's good news. So the employees are there, they're working. Most of them pivoted into PPE devices or were already in the business where they could produce. Uh, and now and we're, we are actually expanding. Um, these companies recognize high unemployment as an opportunity uh, because we have had such a difficult time getting employees into our startup companies because people had other options. There may be less options now. And uh, But the good news is the fact that uh, these accelerator companies are making it through and growing through this crisis says that we pick the right sectors and there's a certain resiliency to the management and the company structures that are the accelerator, which is something you guys wanted to do. You wanted to go out there and find industries that could could make it through good and bad times, but we're going to be around in the future. And that's what you invested in. And these numbers are starting to indicate we might have hit that. Next chart. So I'm just going to I'm just going to talk about this. Leave that one slide up. I'm going to tell just a few stories. Um, and many of you know this because we've had several meetings, either offline, uh, uh, three of us at a time, et cetera. Um, many of you have been involved in this. So a lot of our companies have um, done good business community efforts through the crisis um, from our Middletown facilities, Birds Creations and Goats in a Coat donated soaps to shelters and hand sanitizers to essential workers, did that on their own as the, as the, as the problem started to uh, mount. Our technology companies in Middletown, uh, one of them, Alternate Esource, paired up with a German company and they've invented and are producing now a thermoscan device, which is a touchless thermometer system, very elegant. You simply look at it and it gives you a no go, go, no go on uh, the, your body temperature. And Drone Tech, again, one of our Middletown companies has been using their drones to deliver PPE uh, equipment and other things to first responders and has been 3D printing face shields. The, uh, in our, the rest of our fashion manufacturing cluster, Mellow, Zeal, and Rondon Footwear have also all pivoted and are making PPE devices, everything from face shields to face masks and hospital gowns, and that has kept all of their employees working. And again, thanks to all the board members who have helped with that. We had a really good partnership with St. Luke's Cornwall Hospital and Nyack Hospital um, on the design specifically of one of the face masks that we sold and they bought thousands of them. And also when, uh, when um, uh, some of our AWOL companies have gotten into the mass production also, and uh, so locally sourcing has become very important to our companies. And I want to shout out to Steve Brescia because he, uh, he got the village of uh, Montgomery DPW to buy a few thousand of those uh, face masks uh, locally from our company, our AWOL company in Chester. And I cannot tell you the number one thing that these companies have asked us for is it's not loan, it's not grant, it's customers. And for those of you in the banking business, you know many of these companies are already leveraged, already have loans. And if they can't show that they have revenue and receivables coming in, et cetera, et cetera, those loans could be called. And they're very worried about those kinds of things. So customers and people buying stuff from them, clients, is the most important thing we can do for these companies right now. Our CBD companies, EMS, which is our testing laboratory, uh, was offering disinfecting uh, services. Uh, they put everybody in these you know, astronaut coats and stuff like that and clean premises that might have been COVID affected, uh, infected. And as you know, they invented a, a sanitization station which we've been using, we bought it as the IDA and we put it out there to the, our accelerator clients 
and the face masks we've made, everyone before it goes to the hospital was disinfected in that UV ultraviolet system. And then Urban Extracts, which is not up and running yet, but has a small pilot line. They're going to Warwick, as you know. They do make some small volume, though, of CBD products. Uh, put out a promotion of 50% off a product, and then the second product would be given away free, donated to a, an essential worker of your choice. And if you don't pick an essential worker, they gave it to a local Warwick essential worker. So the nice thing about that is, these accelerator companies have a community-minded spirit, which is again something we want. We wanted to uh, to have as we grew up new companies here. Very often, people say, "You know, you do everything for these accelerator uh, clients. What do they do to give back?" There you go. There's an example. All right. Um, so, as a result of that, is it, do we have the next chart? Is that the bottom line chart next? No, okay. The accelerator company's bottom line then retained 140 jobs. They're adding 10 new jobs. And as I mentioned, recognized high unemployment as an opportunity to get new, uh, new employees. I might have said that earlier, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> the AWOW clients, almost, Lori, one oh, second. Please, I'm I just so excited say, to go to the next slide, I guess. <laughs> no, no, the accelerator without, I'm just, I'm not showing every slide. The accelerator without walls clients um, that pair up with us, this is also very interesting. Um, Orange Packaging, a uh, wonderful company that we've worked with for years to help them on various projects. Um, they also went into the face shield and mask business uh, and a notable uh, uh, good news business story there is um, when Mello wanted to get in the face shield business and make a very specific face shield for hospitals, uh, we could not get the, the plexiglass necessary to make the, the shield. The supply chain was completely dried up, months to get the material. And uh, in speaking with Orange Packaging, as we were helping them on some other things they were doing, they said they had, they had plastic in stock. They needed it for their own product, but they willingly gave us a six-day supply of plastic and then helped us find us, uh, use their source gave us half of their supply for the next two weeks until we could create our own supply for Mellow. So that is in, in local business, almost unheard of how closely these companies are willing to work together for the greater good. And then that is just very heartwarming to all of us in the manufacturing business. And then Lucas Naturals, which is a company that uh, is in Chester, they've been there now about six months. We've been working with them for about two years. They're a startup, but not in our accelerator. They had enough money to have their own facility. They've been sourcing N95 masks and hand-free uh, temperature uh, devices. Um, and that company's also hiring significantly. And we'll talk about that later. And one last example I want to give. So um, PRG, and this uh, PRG is a billion dollar company, national company, that makes props for Broadway and um, uh, the, the uh, entertainment industry and animatronic things. And they have a, a facility in New Windsor and uh, they, they have a machine shop and carpentry shops, very talented people, the ability to make mechanical things, stuff like that. And uh, uh, Steve Brescia actually had uh, heard from them that they had were, start, were making some face shields. And so he wanted to link us up to see if we could help each other. And we talked to them and it, they had a face shield uh, that they were pivoting to make to help out. Uh, it was not, it's not their core business, obviously. And, uh, but they don't have any work making sets, sceneries and props right now. So we hooked them up with our company alternate resource in Middletown that has that thermal scan touchless technology. So PRG is a very art, artsy company and alternate resource, very technical. So remember the new world or the world we're gonna live in for the next year anyway, is we're gonna be taking people's temperature many, many times a day, right? We're gonna take it on the way into work. We're gonna take it, uh, if you leave work to go to lunch, you're gonna take it at the, at the restaurant and they're gonna take it when you go into the store on the way home and you're gonna take it when you get back to work. So many, many times a day. And then picture that when you're at a baseball game or a Broadway show or uh, the entrance to a hospital or to a government center. So having, you know, people right now are using these little thermal guns and stuff, and that serves its purpose. But having an industrial quality yet elegant kiosk solution 
is uh, very marketable. So PRG is taking that technology and integrating it, and we have some renderings already. It looks beautiful. And our goal is we hope that this billion-dollar company will help our startup company, and together they can go forward with a new product in the field. Again, that is exactly what we wanted from the accelerator, to tie together companies that could help each other so that everybody moves forward. And lastly, FPS Apparel, which is where the village of Montgomery purchased their mask from, um, they were in Florida, New York, uh, two years ago, uh, and they were having some uh, some difficulty in uh, in getting the business going. And we worked with them for some time, and uh, very pleased to tell you they have moved to Chester in a, twice the space, and um, they are hiring right now, uh, hiring 15 people, as a matter of fact, and they're doing really well in making things like face masks, et cetera. When they brought their people back to work, well, as they pivoted to uh, keep their people working, uh, their employees were very nervous about coming back to work. We did help FPS to figure out how to do the right health protocols and space things out and spread people over shifts. And, and they also implemented a new bonus pay system to thank their employees for taking the risk of coming to work, but more importantly, to you know produce these products that are very much needed. So the point of all that is that the fashion cluster, the medical device cluster, personal care products are doing really well through these bad times. They're growing. And when you add our accelerator plus accelerator without walls, uh, uh, companies together, we're hiring over, now you gotta help me, Lori. I believe it's 30 people right now, maybe a little more. So now, Lori, it's over to you. You have the now, now I can finally change the slide. No, so uh, so the efforts you know have been significant from the IDA's perspective to help the community of Orange County to move forward. So obviously Galileo is our managing director for our accelerators, but we've all, we've also brought in the Orange County Citizens Foundation along with staff to uh, provide local companies with their guidance. Right. So right on the first day, we announced on March twenty seventh that we would be um, sort of rolling out this recovery assistance program. Uh, the right away we heard from a number of companies, and I'll go over the numbers in a moment, who needed help navigating the SBA process, both loan, EIDL, PPP loans, and one by one, by the hand, we took companies through the application process, and during that identified a number of obstacles that presented themselves, you know, everything from um, my bank isn't an SBA lender to I don't know how to get my taxes because my accountant is, you know, closed because they're not essential. So to the extent possible, we removed obstacles, but we were able to use what we did to really give a lot of support to everybody um, as we learned throughout the process. So with that, the business consulting to help recover and pivot from COVID related impacts. Vinny just told you all about so many businesses were trying to pivot and figuring out what all of this meant for them and how they could really um, take advantage of whatever the situation was and move forward and get better. So we had a wide range of support. Uh, we plan to continue that assistance. You know, we hosted five webinars. The fifth one was this morning. We uh, initially talked about how to apply for the the SBA loans, then we had an SBA representative talking about the loans, we talked about navigating the crisis and how to pivot to the next stage of your business after. <clears throat> and then HR was a big one that we held um, last week about what you can do as a business owner with your company, with your, with your employees, how you navigate a lot of these new looming issues with medical leave and sanitation. And then today's was about, you know, the, the confusion around the SBA loans and whether or not they will remain forgivable grants or remain loans and how you can protect yourself and keep them a forgivable uh, grant rather than having to pay back. Because obviously, you know, a million dollar loan is treated very differently in your business than a million dollar grant. So there were a number of questions and we are able to sort of corral all those questions and research the ones we don't have answers to and provide them back to the public. Um, we've also advocated with our elected officials. We've had Maloney's office and Schumer's office. We've talked with, with Scoofus's office and Metzger's office as well, along with our local legislators and business leaders um, to really try to figure out any issues and overcome them. We have a whole section on our website that is, that is dedicated to COVID recovery. And on that, we have job postings. We have um, every press release, and we also have every webinar that we've done, both a an active PDF that you can either print out or click on for links, and a recording of the entire webinar, so you get to see the interaction between the representatives and the questions that were there. And then last but not least, of course, we rolled out the OCFC loan 
which, you know, again, we, we announced we would be doing it on March 27th, and we had our first committee meeting and approved 40 loans to the OCFC on April 30th. So it was a really incredible amount of activity in the last month. So this is a nice little snapshot of the kinds of things that happened. 140 companies reached out to us basically on day one of the announcement that we would be offering assistance. Um, we brought $10 million approximately to Orange County businesses through our help with them, through working with them, um, through the SBA process. Uh, once we announced the loan program for the OCFC, we got 172 eligibility questionnaires submitted. Every single one of those companies received an application. Of those applications, 46 completed applications, which were then reviewed by the committee and OCFC and approved. Um, essentially, it was 30 days between conception to delivery of the OCFC loan, awarded approximately $500,000 through that program. In addition to that $500,000, we've contributed from both the IDA and OCFC $275,000 toward recovery you know, between consultants and equipment and purchases and webinar, all of these things have, have, have been an incredible value, I think, to the business community. 30 open jobs are listed on our website. Those are jobs that are open now and as a result of the COVID crisis. Five webinars, as I mentioned, we've had over 600 attendees at those webinars and today's had over 150. So, you know, we continue to reach a number of people through this and the most probably exciting part of this to us is naturally we want to foster collaboration between accelerator and AWOW companies you know that's been our goal and they've always we've always had a, a wonderful community of businesses that we know of you know our personal care products or healthcare products but also companies that weren't part of our accelerator network it's really gave us an opportunity to to welcome ourselves or welcome ourselves, introduce ourselves to a larger number of businesses. There's an incredible amount of awareness about the IDA now that didn't exist, I would say three months ago. And a number of people that we reached out to or reached out to us had no idea what an IDA was or how it worked or who we were or what we did. And now there's a lot of, of information about how an IDA works that's really out there. And I think we were able to manage in a way that we never had before and in positive, feelings and awareness of the IDA. Generally, the people who know what an IDA is aren't necessarily the biggest fans of it. There are some conceptions about the IDA, but this has really been different because, you know, statutorily we've been limited to how and what businesses we interact with um, because of the way that, that the laws work and the way that we have to really incentivize real estate driven projects. Um, there is an association with the larger projects, but this being able to deploy the resources of the IDA toward all sizes of businesses has really been an eye opener. And I think something that has been very welcome by the, the, the business community of Orange County. It also enforced our role, you know, as, as leaders and uh, I would say experts in business and you know our our staff has been incredible our partners have been incredible in helping people walk through this thing and i think that everybody who's either reached out to us or attended one of our webinars has really appreciated the fact that if we didn't know the answer we found the answer and got back to them and i think that one of the things we've heard a lot as well is that there's been a lot of there's been a lot of information out in the ether and just not a lot of customized information so that's something we've really taken seriously and again, I can't say this enough, the ability for us to help not only the larger businesses, but now in this particular circumstance, help small businesses, main street businesses, businesses who are just sole proprietors or have one or two employees, it's been really valuable for them, but also for us because it paints a better picture of what our economy in Orange County looks like and how we can better help our businesses. And Vinny, I think you said you wanted to, to read something. Yeah, so I wanna read a... Uh couple of letters that we received. I don't know, for those of you who've been on the IDA a long time, I don't know the last time you received letters of thanks by uh, from companies, but I thought I'd read a few. I wish Bob Scarbice was on this because Bob is always the, the one who says, <laughs> we do so many good things nobody ever knows. Here's a letter from Antonio's Cupcake Factory in New Windsor, New York. I wanted to take a moment to tell you how helpful the Orange County IDA team was. Since the quarantine due to COVID-19, my business was suffering due to the decline in sales. I reached out to the Orange County IDA for assistance. They provided me with resources, helped me fill out applications, and were very helpful and responsive to any questions I had. Because of their help, I am able to stay open during this pandemic. I would highly recommend them to any business looking for assistance. 
Thank you for your time. If I can answer any questions for you, please do not hesitate to contact me. It goes on, we have letters from so many people. Here's This is from Quinn Bowling. I just wanted to say thank you to your organization for helping me during this difficult time. I really appreciate it. Uh, from a fitness academy in, uh, I actually don't know whether whether Matt Santer Fitness Academy. It's a, a gym. I just wanted to say thank you for all that you guys do and have done. This has been a tremendous relief and means the world to me and our business. You don't know how much it helps. I would like to offer you and any others there a free membership to our gym once opened back up as a thank you. Reminder, we take no gifts. Then we have from uh, Cream Newberg, which is a store in Newberg. We specifically talked about how easy it was to work with Melanie, who took their call and helped them through what a great experience it was. And uh, she said Melanie uh, was extremely helpful and that this helped save her store. Uh, or Auric Vacuums in uh, Middletown, New York. I'd like to thank the Orange County IDA for providing information and support to help us make important business decisions about our next steps during the COVID pandemic. Everyone has been very helpful with the pr process. And I'll close with uh, <coughs> the last two. Mike Esposito of Orange Packaging. I just wanted to reach out and thank you for all the help you gave us navigating through the PPP loans, as well as the support you've given us uh, without a wow on engineering our manufacturing plans. Remind me to send you the video of the robotic arms you helped us design for our inflation job. It's so cool to see. And lastly, James DeStefano from Reliable Glass and Door in Newburgh says, uh, Vinny and Lori, I just wanted to say thank you for your help guiding us through the PPP loans. There was so much unknown and so much uncertainty at the start of the situation. Yours and Nancy Proyak's guidance proved to be an asset towards obtaining the loan from our bank. I look forward to working with you again. I'm expecting more challenges lie ahead for businesses in the Hudson Valley and all of New York State as the economic fallout from COVID-19 unfolds. So that's just a sample of the letters that we've been using. Down. <laughs> Vinny, are you still there or are you frozen? Yes. No, you're still there. Okay, so. I finished reading it, yep, that was it. Okay, so as a result of all of that, obviously we've reached many more companies than we have before and outside our uh, comfort zone of manufacturing uh, where we've been focusing our AWOW activities. So we're recommending an expansion of the Accelerator Without Walls mission to include other sectors of Orange County companies. And the uh, uh, Accelerator Committee has authorized us to make this proposal. So our recommendation is to, to actually reach out to the companies that are receiving our OCFC loans, those 50 companies. We feel it's in the best interest of the uh, IDA and the OCFC to provide AWOW support to them. If we can help shore those companies up, it's good for them and more likely you know it'd be easier for us to to get our loan payments uh secondly uh the companies that reached out for us for the cares act for the uh ppp and the idl programs uh since we already have a relationship now with them we want to continue that relationship again to shore them up not everything is no is known or decided about how business is going forward given the COVID crisis so we know we have to continue to be innovative so based on this, we want to include things like retail, hospitality, home repair and remodeling, salons, other personal care services, and health and fitness. Why? Because we're finding that is the economy of Orange County. So yeah, there's distribution centers. Yes, yes, there's the health industry and the, and the hospital fields and, fields, and there's manufacturing. But then there's a huge number of custom, uh, companies who would do nothing like that. Next chart. So our proposal is to take $200,000 from our existing budget, redeploy that money, so reduce in other areas, redeploy that money to, to our AWOW budget so we could provide additional support to those companies we mentioned. Um, Vinny? Yeah. Yeah, Vinny, I think it's, you presented it very well. We've had much discussion about this, and um, I think it shows the IDA also in the funding corporation are refocusing where we're uh, putting all our effort and time as well, like these other businesses all are themselves right now. So to redeploy the money, I think is certainly the way to go for now. And later on, if we need more funding or whatever, then we can revisit that as well. Um, so waiting for 
your next report uh, about where you want to take it. Uh, you and Lori can work on that with all your staffing. And so I think it's moving in the right direction. Thank you. Lori? Yep. Um, actually, this is one oh, last. Uh, so the first chart we showed you what the effect of the pandemic is on the cycle of a business. This is your chart to use on your own. Read, show your friends. If anybody asks you exactly what is the IDA doing during this crisis, this is all in one place. How, what we're trying to affect and all of the things we put in place, which I think as Lori started uh, this in the very beginning is that it's not just that $500,000 that we put towards the loans. It's so much more. And, and quite frankly, that's where we're getting most of the appreciation and attention from the business industry. Next chart, the takeaways. And there you go. Sure. So I think that, you know, of, I know that a lot of the, um, a lot of you board members might get questions about kind of the idea. I will say to on this last chart, um, the 500,000 loans from the OCFC, of course, at the very bottom right hand corner, you'll see the total expenditure of 775. I think I just want to make it clear that while the IDA can't give a loan out of the IDA funds, the IDA still has con committed significant resources to recovery efforts. And I think that that's fair to, to discuss, you know, between software and supplies and consultants and all of these things that we've done, you know, we've really um, taken it to heart and done everything we could within the confines that we have. So in addition to that, you know, we've assisted 190 companies in retaining jobs. We've helped create 30 more in the midst of a pandemic. The OCFC deployed a $500,000 loan program to companies in need within 30 days. By the way, of these, just so everyone knows, we'll talk about this um, more in the OCFC, of course, but the, the, the companies are getting checks right now. It's starting to, to roll out. So the, the money is real and out in the community. And then lastly, I think just for board members, it's so important to know that this is, I believe, elevated the reputation of the IDA while also broadening our reach, which is something that's so important, not only in this time, but I think this really poises us for after this crisis is behind us, God willing, one day, that we will actually still be able to have as strong a tie to the business community as we do now. I think that that's something that's really something to look forward to. Um, so there are no more there. I think that we would just need, uh, Kevin, you might correct me if I'm wrong, but we do, would we need a motion and second to reappropriate $200,000 to the AWOW program? Correct. I think the actual line items that's going to come out of you can do later. Okay. 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 So move. Second. Second. Third. Okay. Fourth. All in. Thank you. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions before uh, we finally stop talking to you all? <laughs> no? Mary Ellen, back to you. All in favor? Yep. Aye. Aye. <laughs> I must have on the chairwoman there, but. <laughs> Is she here? Oh, she's muted. You're muted, Mary Ellen. Um, there you go. Yeah, now we voted, right? Not yet. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. See, well, I thought I voted. <laughs> I think some people did. I don't okay. think everybody did. <laughs> yeah, no. All right. So uh, I, we did have a motion in a second. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> Any uh, opposition? Okay, good. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, the next up on the agenda is the uh, uh, board committee reports and it has an audit committee report, but is there a report this month? No, there wasn't. No, I didn't think so. Okay, so then the governance committee, I know the governance committee met today. We did. Eddie, would you like to speak to it or would you like me to walk through it? Lori, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> so um, we talked about three things. One was that there was the um, 2020 corporate mission and goals statement, which is something that the governance committee adopts every month or every year, not every month. Um, it's part of the audit that we submit to the state. So we've approved the report as presented. It was with some feedback from last month's meeting, which of course now I can't find it. It's not right in my fingertips, but it's, I believe we attempted to create 150 jobs and retain 200. Normally we attempt to create more than we retain, but knowing, yes, that's right. But knowing what we know about the economy right now, we decided to flip that. So that was adopted. Um, I don't believe that that has to be a, Kevin, does that go for the full board? Or that's just the governance, the report, the, the, um, corporate mission and goal. Can we put it on Paris? Yeah. That, but, yeah. For 2020. 
Yeah, so I would say I would have the board adopt it. Okay, so the governance committee did, and then we would ask that the full board um, a recommendation also adopt the 2020 corporate mission and goals. So moved. Okay, thank you. I'll second. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, uh, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Okay, you're good. Great. Uh, okay. One, what, I'm sorry, we have two other items in governance. I'm sorry. I, I promise sorry. to stop and then I just keep talking. I know. <laughs> Um, the first is that um, Melanie and Kevin did a lot of work over the past few months to review and revise all of our policies that pertain to the IDA. Um, they were all in the packet for this month, but they were the audit services policy, certificate of independence of members, compensation reimbursement and attendance policy, defense and indemnification policy, disposition of property, FOIL, investment and deposit, procurement, travel, and whistle, whistleblower policies. Kevin went through them in detail in governance um, and governance upon a review recommended uh, to the board to adopt them. So unless you would like Kevin to go over them in detail now or just take their recommendation, we would need a motion and a second. Motion. Second. All in. Any other comments or questions? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, you're approved. And then last thing was the lease for 334 Avenues of Amer Avenue of Americas in New Windsor um, had come due. So Kevin reached out to the town attorney of New Windsor and we were able to extend that lease. Uh, currently would expire in June. Now it will expire in May of 2022, May 31st of 2022. As a reminder, the lease for that facility is uh, 124848 and will, in will increase 2% or CPI, whichever is greater. Here Correct. As so, first. Right. right. So again, governance committee uh, approved it and recommended it for approval for the full board. So we would need a motion and second for that as well. That's the buildings at the bottom of the hill there. Correct. Yes. Yeah, the okay. first one that you retrofitted. Right. Right. Okay. So moved. Thank you. Second. Okay. Any other further questions or comments? Okay. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve or I'm sorry. I'll all those in favor, please say aye. I don't know where I am right now. Okay, any opposition? Okay, thank you. You're so approved. Great. Okay. And Lori, now can I I'm add, gonna... Lori, before you yeah. pass it on, okay. we, we just mentioned it, we're not gonna go through it today. The artificial intelligence uh, accelerator though, we're picking up on that. Um, uh, we're getting a lot of interest. That is an industry sector, believe it or not, where this crisis uh, can really, really be interesting for us. Oh yeah, they a would lot definitely of, right? Yeah. yeah, and a lot of these companies are in New York City, and are now they, they are much more open minded to moving to a place like Highland Falls. So we are getting a lot of calls on that. Um, next meeting will go in great detail. We just had too much to talk about today. Okay, that's good news. Okay, so the last up is the uh, applications and resolutions that's for Southgate Flats. That's and is correct. that what uh, this gentleman, Rick, uh, yes. is waiting for? Yes. It is. So, okay, um, so uh, before we unmute him, do you want me to just remind everybody what the project is and the score? Yes. Sure. Okay. Yep. So this is a hotel in Highland Falls, and Rick, of course, will will speak to it um, a little bit as well. But it's a hotel in Highland Falls that has a wide array of support. Um, when we received the application, um, quite some time ago now, it was actually received a score of 21, which on our scoring matrix actually qualifies for a high pilot. I'm going to remind everybody what those. Um, those uh, categories are. So the first was the strategic vision, uh, scored a five out of five in strategic vision because it's certainly a tourism in Highland Falls is something that everybody is focused on. And it's a, definitely a needed um, industry cluster and it's highly supported by the mayor. Uh, the rateable value is a two that's determined by the project cost. This is a $39, $39 million project. So that was a two. Number of jobs um, was a four. Rick will tell us what the jobs is. Are because I don't have the application up in front of me right now. The quality of jobs was actually at a zero. It's not unusual for a hotel to have a zero in the quality because there are jobs under minimum wage. As a reminder, our score sheet has, if there are any jobs at minimum wage, um, 
I'm sorry, I said under before I meant at, there are any jobs at minimum wage or under $15 an hour, it scores a zero, but there are a wide array of jobs in this um, facility. The location is a five, again, because Highland Falls is a designated growth zone as determined by the IDA. The company in, is investing in using veteran owned and local vendors for this hotel. And desirability, again, was a five because it's located in a distressed area, it's uh, remediating or repurposing um, an old property, there is local favor for the project and we have supervisor or I'm sorry the mayor's support uh, for the project a number of other people have issued their support for this project as well so the um, again came to a 21 and 21 to 30 qualifies for a high pilot so the only question I would have um, for the board members to go forward is we have a hotel pilot and we have a 10-year pilot so that would be the only other determination that would need to be made today um, but maybe we want to turn it over to Rick for a second to talk a little bit about the project, uh, Chairwoman, would that be, would you like? To yeah, no, I think that's fine. Okay, Rick, I would say the floor is yours. Yes, hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to the meeting. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. I know you have been in the meeting for quite some time now. Um, uh, again, to recap the uh, overview that was just given, uh, we're looking at building a 79 uh, room uh, full service hotel right at the gate of West Point and Highland Falls right across the street from the McDonald's on Main Street. Um, the property will have um, a spa and salon, a rooftop pool. It'll have a, a restaurant on the first floor and then a, with a bar and a bar on the sixth floor. And it'll be primarily used for conferencing and, uh, and as a wedding venue and of course for transient guests uh, as a complement to the existing Thayer Hotel at West Point. Uh, and the property will be run in concert as a sister property of the Thayer Hotel to try and expand the attraction of guests uh, to the Hudson Valley, in particular to uh, to Highland Falls, to take advantage of all the surrounding Hudson Valley uh, amenities. The uh, pro uh, project is uh, currently uh, estimated to provide uh, 124 uh, FTEs during the construction period, with 32 uh, in, uh, 32 FTEs through reduced impact and uh, 77 FTEs from other industry sectors associated with its construction for a total of 234 FTE jobs. And then once completed, we're looking at a permanent uh, uh, FTE creation of about 66 jobs, upward to 90 for the operation of the hotel with a uh, indirect impact of uh, 12 FTEs and induced impact of, F of 12 FTEs for an overall impact of 90 FTEs during the annual operations. And that's with the hotel only operating at a 32% occupancy. Uh, and as it progresses and increases its performance up to 50 and 60%, which is pretty much the in industry average, uh, we'll be able to include additional headcount uh, through FTEs and job creation. Um, so I'll, uh, that's a bit of an overview of the of the hotel, its amenities, and what we have. And uh, happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. When are you going to get started on the construction? Do you know? Uh, we don't know at this time. The, the COVID, we we were scheduled to start uh, in April uh, with our, you know, with our demolition. As you know, we've been working to try to get in front of the IDA for some time for our resolution approval. But the uh, COVID scenario has really caused the public meetings within the village to slip in order to get our negative declaration. So uh, we've now got public meetings scheduled uh, with the uh, planning review board uh, on the 20th, 21st of, uh, of May. Uh, for hopefully for our project to be approved, so we've uh, they've they've started having their their um, Zoom meetings. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Okay, so uh, hearing none, I guess we have to go on to the final resolution. Correct. 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 Want to read it? Sure. Final resolution: Southgate Flats Limited. Resolution authorizing the Orange County Industrial Development Agency to take a leasehold interest in an aggregate approximately 0.68 acre parcel of land located at 479 Main Street in the village of Highland Falls, town of Highlands, Orange County, New York. Appoint Southgate Flats Limited, Limited as its agent to undertake a certain project, negotiate and execute a lease agreement, leaseback agreement, and related tax agreement, 
provide financial assistance to the company in the form of a sales and use tax exemption for purchase and rentals related to the acquisition, construction and equipment of the project, B, a partial real property tax abatement structure to the tax agreement, and C, if necessary, a mortgage recording tax exemption for financing related to the project, and five rela execute related documents. So moved. Okay, thank you, Kip. Uh, thanks, Steve. Need a second? We'll set that. <clears throat> thank you, John. Now, I got okay. a question. Sure. The pilot, is that a 10 year pilot or a mile to my 10 year pilot? Well, that's actually a good question because I was going to ask that too. So in our UTEP, because of the scoring of this project, it could either qualify, and we've done the uh, real property spreadsheets for both the four-year pilot and our standard 10-year. So not the 485B, but our 10-year, which is 10% per year over 10 year. So the board would still need to make a determination about which one um, it's approving today. Sorry, I'm going to jump in one second. I believe this one was up for 15. No, per, 10. Didn't the town say they had a preference on 15? No, 10, 10 over, 10 over four. It was 10? mentioned something about that, but okay. the town may have, but in our UTEP, I don't think that the 15 year would, would be appropriate. I so think we should go for 10, uh, IDA 10 year pilot, you know, we're 10% yeah. going up each year. Exactly, I agree with that. I, what, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. A 10-year pilot, you know, starting off, you know, IDA with 10% the first year and going up 10% each year. All right, so you're in favor of the 10-year? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. 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 Me too. Okay, me three. Um, anybody else have any other questions or comments? One question. Sure. Did we have an original idea of what the pilot was going to be? What do you mean an original idea? When it idea? first came into discussion? Yeah, so it was both. It was always either 10 or 15. It was contingent upon the score that it received. Um, the only reason it qualifies for the 10 is because it scored over 20. So if it had scored 20 or less, it would have been only eligible for the four year. So we had uh, we went through that and then the public hearing as well. The public hearing also, we got a lot of comments from the town and the school that um, you know for the expectation of receiving their taxes for 10 years was they were amenable to it. So there wasn't opposition to the 10. And the biggest, the biggest score on the scorecard that brought it to the 21? The biggest one was the, the, the local favor for it, quite frankly, the, uh, the, the vision of it, because I know that the, the mayor wants to incentivize business there and grow businesses there. It's also from our perspective, Highland Falls is one of the places that we've identified as a growth zone, like Port Jervis, Highland Falls, and Stewart Airport. And then we received support letters, I'm looking at them now from Senator Scoofus, the Town of Highland, the Chamber of Commerce, the Orange County Tourism, Assemblyman Colin Schmidt, Congressman Patrick Maloney, Steve Newhouse, and of course, the Mayor of Highland Falls. So those Thank are the others kicked it over. Yeah, and I apologize. I miss. I misspoke. I, I forgot it was that they said they preferred a ten over a four year for some reason. <clears throat> yeah, no problem. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions or comments? Okay. All right. So we'll go to. Uh, we have a motion and a second, correct? Right. Yeah, we have. A, yeah, we have a motion okay. and a second. Right. So we'll do the roll call, and then we uh, possibly uh, will indicate that it's a ten year pilot. Mr. Diana. Yes. Mr. DeSalvo. Abstain. Mr. Brescia? Yes. Mr. Gatos? Yes. Mr. McCarry? Yes. Mr. Schreibach is absent. Madam Chairwoman Rogowski? Yes. That's five eyes, Madam Chairwoman. The resolution's adopted. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, is there any other business to be brought before this august body? <laughs> Okay, uh, hearing none, then I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, and second. All those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Okay, uh, do we wanna jump right into the OCFC or we wanna take a five minute break? Or?